Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I guess this is going to be Temple Part 8. This is more of a history lesson than it is a Bible lesson, although there will be some Bible stuff in it. You see... Jerusalem and the land of Israel is right there in the Middle East. It's close to Africa, Asia, and Europe, where they all come together. Basically, it's considered, I guess in the Lord's eyes, like the center of the world. You know, excluding, you know, Australia and America. But back then, this this was the known world. And... The thing is, there was always different kings and countries always vying for power. And the thing is, we had in the last lesson, we covered how the Medes and the Persians had conquered Babylon and allowed Judah to return to Jerusalem if they wanted to and rebuild the temple and it's amazing I mean in the last lesson we saw in Isaiah and how uh, Cyrus was mentioned by name that he would do the will of the Lord to allow them to go back and rebuild the temple and be re have their the implements that they needed the gold and the silver uh, cups and what have you and to finance it so there was a rededication of the temple in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah and that continued for a while now, according to scholars, the Medes and the Persians were sort of like cousins. You know, they were uh, very, very similar people, although there were some differences between them. What those are, I don't really know. It is so difficult trying to find useful information on history. I had a history book that I got from my uh, college probably around 1986, 87, somewhere around that time period. And it was from a, uh, I think it was Roosevelt College at the time. And it merged with the present college, which is now Palm Beach State College. And they were getting rid of these old books. This book was written in the early 1920s, right after World War I. And I read this book, and it stated that the great majority of Americans during World War I, if we were going to join the war, they wanted to join the war on the side of Germany against the British. And that one quarter of the United States was of Germanic extraction. Yeah. So a quarter of the country were Germans or related to the Germans, and they wanted to fight against England. Because after all, a hundred years prior, who burned the capital of the United States? It wasn't Germany. It was England. War of 1812? So, well, 110 years or so. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing the stuff that the old books have. And uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't find that information today. Matter of fact, I was doing some history on Darius or Darius. And one piece of history said that he only existed in the Bible. They said, well, he really didn't exist, but the Bible mentions him, but he really, you know, he's just a historical figure in the Bible. And the Bible, you know, basically they're saying 
the only place that Darius or Darius existed was in the Bible. He did, he's not even existed in history. And then I read other parts, and uh, they were like, oh yeah, he existed. He was the successor to Cyrus. And then there was a minor ruler of Cyrus some uh, that existed for a very short period of time. I think he was assassinated. And then Darius took over, or Darius, whatever you want to call him. Uh, it's so hard to find out useful information. It really is. So, but the time period between the temple that they rebuilt until the time of Christ was approximately 400 to 450 years. And there was a period of time when the Persians uh, were basically in control of the area, Babylon and Jerusalem and that whole area. And Persia was a very uh, the Persian Empire was a very large empire for a while. Matter of fact, uh, they had conquered parts of Greece for a while. Uh, perhaps you've heard of, what was that movie, the, uh, the, the 300, the Spartans or whatever, the Battle of Thermopylae. Uh, the, the Greeks were fighting, the Spartan Greeks were fighting against the Persians. Well, they were rivals for quite a long period of time. Now, I'm not going to give you an, any exact dates, but uh, Ezra was approximately 400 to 450 years before Christ, and it was under Persian rule. And then around, around 323 A.D., 312 A.D., somewhere around that time, uh, Alexander, who was called the Great, uh, conquered the area. That's what they called the Hellenistic period. He was a Macedonian, which is basically, is sort of like the Greeks. I mean, it was just like a Greek province. And... Greece was chopped up into all these little city-states. You had Athens, you had uh, Sparta, you've heard of the Spartans, and they were always squabbling amongst themselves. The Spartans were the premier land troops, soldiers, and then Athens had the, uh, the Athenian navy. And they had, you know, they had an army too, but the Spartans were... Uh, they were the, I guess, the premier fighters of Greece, I guess. So, But Alexander's father, who was Philip, had uh, came down, conquered him city by city by city, and then Alexander came in and did pretty much the same thing and kept his rule, and he unified Greece. He unified it and then made it a formidable fighting force. So basically, they about after the uh, Persians were in charge of Jerusalem area for about a hundred years, along comes the Macedonian Greeks and they take it. And then, from what I understand, Around 245, 224, uh, Parthia, the Parthian Empire, took control of Jerusalem for a brief period of time. I'm not exactly sure how that works out, but I think the Greeks took it back over. Now, there's a lot of conflicting data here. But from 323 B.C. to approximately 30 B.C., so for almost, oh, I don't know, over close to, close to 300 years, 
Greece was in charge of the area around Jerusalem. After Alexander's death, the guy was uh, guy started taking control of an army when he was 18 years old. He was very, very successful in battle with his, you know, his father. And then his father died, and then at, he ascended to power at, at 20 years old, and he was he died in his young 30s. But according to history, he never lost a single battle, not one. So he conquered all the way from India, parts of India, all the way to Egypt and uh, all of Palestine, Israel, uh, the whole area pretty much, all of Greece. Uh, I mean, he conquered the whole area. Now, when you're conquered for, you know, 300 years, guess what? They learned the Greek language. Greek was spoken all over the known world. I know I've taught this in the past, but I mean, it was, you know, for 300, about 300 years, it was the language of the Middle East. I mean, totally. Rome didn't conquer the area until about 30 years before the birth of Christ. You know, 300 years is a long time for the people to learn and be speaking Greek. And uh, I don't know if you've heard of it, but the uh, there's a thing called the Septuagint. And from what I understand, Alexander wanted the Hebrew Old Testament translated into Greek and put into the library at Alexandria, Egypt, which was named in his honor. And for a while there, I was very, very skeptical of the Septuagint because uh, all the demon nominational teachings. But I'm beginning to think that perhaps the Septuagint is a legitimate Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures. I see no reason not to. Uh, but I don't know. There's a lot of disinformation out there, and it's hard to know. It really is. And you know, I don't claim to understand all this very well. I'm just kind of muddling through it, trying to give you a little bit of an overview here because you got to realize they built the second temple after Babylon destroyed it under the Persians who ruled that area for about 100 years. And then along comes the Greeks and they're in power for almost 300 years. Now, there was a short period of time there, supposedly, when the Parthians were in power, about 20 years. And the Parthians, believe it or not, were in an area similar to what the, uh, the Persians were. But from what I understand, they were connected to the Scythians, and they were kind of a nomadic people. So they moved around a little bit. And if one area gave them too much trouble they just moved <laughs> so that's a good way to do things right and that's what israel did for a long time you know they had tents they moved but rome didn't conquer the area until about 30 years before christ so there was approximately almost right around plus or minus 300 years that the Greeks were in charge. Now, when Alexander died, they split his kingdom up into four areas. His four generals took it over. And, of course, the generals didn't trust each other, didn't help each other, and they were fighting against each other. So, by the time Rome rose up to power... 
they were easy pickings. Really stupid, you know, fighting against your own people. But, uh, I mean, think about it. The, the library at Alexandria, Egypt, was named for Alexander. I mean, he just conquered that whole area. Now, what's the deal with, um, why Greece? What's up with Greece? All right, let's take a little bit of a look at the book of Joel. Joel is got a lot of prophecy in it. A lot of people just, they don't get it. You know, the Old Testament's got so much prophecy in it. A lot of it has yet to be fulfilled. Joel chapter 3 and verse 1. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. See, they sold their pe God's people into slavery. Verse 4, Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coast of Palestine? Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me swiftly and spe speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? In other words, paybacks, you know, payback is a, a B, yeah. Verse 5, because ye have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly, pleasant things. Now, Tyre and Zidon were associated with the Phoenicians, which some of the Phoenicians possibly were Israel, tribe of Dan, but they were also associated with the Canaanites. I don't know. You know, it's just... History is just so convoluted, it's hard to even know what is what. All the history books have been rewritten. All the old books have been destroyed or lost. Um, the you-know-whos actually scour through eBay and what have you, buying up the old history books, especially books like the, um, uh, the uh, like the, for example, I used to go to a, a bookstore in Denver. And I used to buy books on the Masonic Lodge, their own books. I guess what happened was somebody, you know, somebody's granddad was a Mason, and then they would sell the books. And I used to be able to buy these books for 2 or $3 or whatever. And there'd be a little imprint on the book and saying, uh, if this book is sold or whatever to, you know, uh, Call the Masonic Lodge at this number, and we will purchase this book for, we'll purchase this book for so much amount, or something like that. And the book guy was like, "Eh, I can get twenty dollars for this book right now, but if you give me twenty-two, it's yours." I was like, "Okay," you know. So, and I would read their books and find out exactly what did they teach instead of listening to somebody else that wasn't. A mason telling me what they believed you know if i want to know what christ believes i'm going to go to the king james bible i'm not going to go to the uh, jehovah's witnesses and read their material you know so so the tyre and zidonians were possibly dan possibly canaanites possibly a mix of both so verse six Listen to this, talking about Tyre and Zidon. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold, have ye sold unto the Grecians. Ah, you see, they, 
they took the children of Judah and the children of Jerusalem and they sold them as slaves into Greece to the Greeks, the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. Guess what? Is it possible some of the Greeks were the children of Judah? Is it possible some of them were Israelites? I think so. Why do you think the New Testament was written in Greek? I mean, the Lord set it up that the, you know, uh, under the Persians, they, uh, the 70 years that Jerusalem and Judah was under captivity with the Babylonians, after 70 years, the Persians allowed them to return and rebuild the temple. And then, about 100 years later, here comes Alexander the Macedonian Greek. And for close to around 300 years, everybody uh, spoke Greek. And there was a lot of, from what, if you read about it, there's what they, what they called Hellenization of the Jews. There was a bunch of Greek-speaking Judahites. People, you know, they were, they knew Greek. And a lot of the, uh, from what I understand, some of the Jews didn't like that. They thought, well, you guys are too Greek for us, even though you might be Judah. So, the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians that ye might remove them far from their border. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them and will return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hands of the children of Judah and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off, for the Lord hath spoken it. I believe the Sabaeans are the Arabs. Now, when the Greeks first came in, well, maybe not first came in, but after Alexander died and his general uh, took over Jerusalem, from what I understand, he didn't particularly care for Judah and from what I understand, he went and rededicated the temple to, I think, Zeus, you know, a Greek god, and sacrificed a pig on the altar. And then you had the revolt of the Maccabees, M-A-C-C-A-B-E-E-S, if my memory serves me correctly. Let me look that up. All right, yeah. M-A-C-C-A-B-E-E-S. Macca and bees, like b busy as a bee. Uh, they revolted against the Greeks for a while. And there was a lot of Greek influence in there. And from what I understand, they fought against Esau Edom, which was north, and conquered them, supposedly, and by the edge of the sword, they told them to convert to Judaism. And if you remember your history, Esau Edom, Idumea, God called them the people of my curse. Oh, I, you know, I have to wonder, were these Maccabees, uh, I don't think that they were led of the Lord. I honestly think that they were satanic. And why in the world would they want the people of God's curse coming to the temple and worshiping? And according to Josephus, King Herod and his family were of this cursed satanic seed line. This is, and if they put in to power 
these horrible people when now Herod put a lot of money into the temple not because he wanted to worship God no for control he wanted to control the scene he had Caiaphas remember Caiaphas he was the one that uh, had Christ condemned and uh, what was his the Caiaphas and the other one I forget the name but uh, yeah these were you know Herod the Herod family when Christ was born in Bethlehem and the wise men came and asked him well who, where is he that is born that would be you know the king we have seen his star in the east and what did Herod do he ended up killing all the children in Bethlehem trying to, to, to kill Christ you know there was nothing nothing good ever came out of the Herod family that I can read in the Bible or in history nothing they were rotten to the core it was one of the Herod family that had uh, John the Baptist's head cut off remember uh, what was it Salome whatever danced for Herod although he probably didn't really want to do it but he did it anyways for the oath sake you know there was just bad to the bone George Thorogood, bad to the bone? Yeah, that was them. Bad to the bone. Rottenness. So the, th the point is, the Greeks probably had some Israelite, Judahite blood in them. And that's why the New Testament was written in Greek. And the whole area spoke Greek. So when the gospel got preached in Greek, everybody would understand it. Well, maybe not everybody, but you get my drift. Rome was a newcomer. They only came 30 years before Christ was born and conquered the uh, Jerusalem. 30 years. So, the majority of the people spoke Greek. And the, the Jews that didn't speak Greek, uh, they, they had arguments with the, uh, the Greek-speaking Jews the Hellenized Jews, and they thought, uh, you know, they they thought that they were kind of like second-class citizens. Uh, you know the 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 original Greek Olympics. Do you know that everybody had to do that in the nude? You know why? Uh, they wanted to make sure that all the participants had the right equipment. In other words. The Olympics was only for men. Women were not allowed to compete in the Olympics. So, you know, the the uh, the uh, the true children of Judah found that vile. So there was a lot of stuff going on that I wish I understood better, but I don't. But this is the background that when Christ appeared, what he, the world that he lived in. And it was said that Rome had conquered Greece militarily, but spiritually Greece had conquered Rome because Rome adopted all the uh, Greek gods. They may not have called them by the same names, they, you know, but they renamed them. But they worship basically the same gods. And it's funny, Greek mythology has a, a legend of a flood, just like Noah. Greek mythology, they had the Titans. You know what the Titans were? They were the giants that were born of the gods that came down from heaven and married the beautiful women and had children that were giants. Wow, where do I read that? Oh, yeah, Genesis 6, before the flood and after the flood. You know, King David, Goliath, you know, they have found skeletons all over the world. Between 
12 and 30 feet long. Matter of fact, they had pictures in newspapers from 100 years ago in the United States where they found skeletons before the you-know-whos bought up all the publishing houses. And, you know, these are not photoshopped, okay? They didn't have Photoshop 100 years ago. They found them in Kentucky. They found them in Ohio. They found them in New Mexico. Uh, even the American Indians had stories about them fighting giants. I've heard reports that there were giants being fought in Afghanistan by our uh, soldiers. I don't know how true it is. Um, the Japanese in World War II on New Guinea reported that they, some of the army units recorded that they had battles with um, giants. I heard that there were stories of them in uh, Vietnam during the Vietnam War, that they would throw these huge stones at the, um, the troops. Uh, but, you know, they, they dismiss all these stories saying, oh, those guys were probably high on some really good uh, Vietnamese weed or something, you know, or they were stoned out of their minds with heroin, uh, which during the Vietnam War, they were saying that 25% of our troops were uh, probably on some kind of drugs, which I don't doubt it. I really don't doubt it. So, you know, there's no telling. But I find it interesting that uh, possibly a lot of the Greeks were probably Israelites. I mean, why else would the Lord have the New Testament written in Greek, not Hebrew? When people tell me the New Testament was written in Hebrew and then mistranslated into Greek by those anti-Semitic Greeks, um, they're either deceived or deceivers. There's 5,000 plus partial manuscripts in Greek and zero Hebrew ones. Zero. Another thing, too, to consider, the Greek Orthodox Church evangelized Eastern Europe. And a matter of fact, in Israeli newspapers, they report that the most anti-Semitic country in all the world is Greece. Let me tell you something. Greece honors Jesus. They really do. Almost, it seems like a very high percentage of the Greeks are involved with their church. A very high percentage. Of course, a lot of the clergy is corrupted like ours. But that doesn't take away from the faith that these people have. And the European Union does everything they can in their power to impoverish the Greeks. And, of course, when you realize that the you-know-whos say that the most anti-Semitic person that ever lived was Jesus, um, yeah, of course Greece is the most anti-Semitic country in the world. I mean, what do you expect? So, I don't know. So, this is what, this is laying the groundwork for when Jesus came on the scene. I absolutely know for a fact that Greek was the language of commerce. I mean, that whole area for 300 years was just, that was the language of commerce and business. And like I say, Rome had only recently conquered it 30 years before Christ came into power. I mean, uh, Rome had only 30 years prior come into power before Jesus was born and started his ministry. So, I mean, there's a very real possibility that when Jesus was conversing with Pilate at his trial, so to speak, that they were conversing in Greek. There's a real possibility. Uh, of course, Jesus could have known Latin. I mean, 
you know, <laughs> he could have known everything if he wanted. Uh, but there's a very real possibility that they spoke Greek. And think about it. What did Pilate, when he put the uh, inscription on the cross, what did it say? This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. It was in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Yeah. And if you, uh, if you lived in that area, you spoke at least one of those three languages, possibly two. Possibly two. But the Hellenized Jews, they, they didn't know Hebrew. They might have known a little bit, but they, they spoke Greek. You can read about it. Uh, the Maccabees didn't particularly care for the Greek-speaking Jews. But uh, like I've mentioned before, they, at the point of a sword, took the Edomites, Esau, Edom, Idumeans, and forcibly converted them to Judaism. Well, that's not what Ezra did. Ezra told them, separate, separate yourselves from the heathens of the land. What did the Maccabees do? Hey, let's bring them in. So, you can study the history for yourself and decide, you know, because I don't have a definitive answer. I'm just trying to give you a broad overview of what that area was like when Christ was incarnated into human flesh in the womb of Mary. So, all right, uh... I told you this was going to be more of a history lesson, but it lays the background for what's coming next, which is the la uh, Herod, the, the temple, and its destruction by the Romans in 70 A.D., and then Christ being our high priest, and uh, what Christ has to say about the temple. But Herod, he didn't... Uh, he didn't build that temple. Well, he didn't build it, but he expanded it and made it very, very, I guess you could say opulent. Really fancy. But for control. He wanted to control the narrative. So, all right. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and his only begotten Son, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.